So today we're going to talk about uh, Git bomb. Now, originally this talk was going to be given by Ed Warnicke and uh, Ava Black, but uh, Ed Warnicke got uh, iced in in, uh, in Austin, and uh, Ava Black uh, came down with an illness. And so we went down through the Rolodex of various other Omnibore people who are present, and uh, I was top of the list. So, uh, so please excuse me, the slide deck. Uh, it's not one that I that I wrote, but I will do my best to give the spirit of the uh, of the talk. Uh, I did write a significant portion of two of the six implementations of Omnibore, so I can definitely answer questions on the technical side. Please raise your hand and interrupt me if you have questions along the way, because it's better to get the questions out as we go rather than uh, let them sit and uh, and linger, because there'll be other people with the same set of questions and. Uh, but it's up to you on how, on how, how you want to deal with that. So first, uh, let's talk about timeline. So we had a colonial pipeline hack, which occurred in May 2021. I'm pretty sure everyone here is familiar with it. Um, and uh, that ended up causing the, secure, the cybersecurity executive order to be put out by the, uh, by the Biden administration. Uh, but if we go back in time, we actually can see that much of the much of the work that had been done that led up to uh, to Omnibore was the creation of uh, of SPDX, which was launched in February 2010. And uh, before that, where some of that work came from was from initially the an industrialized S bomb that would have been done at Cisco, where Cisco had a requirement to know exactly where all their infrastructure or all of their stuff was coming from, so they can work out what uh, so they can work out where. Where did the hardware come from? Uh, what software patches and so on within their within their uh, switches and routers? And so, uh, however, mistakes were made. <laughs> Maybe. But at the same time, much was learned. So again, back to the timeline. Uh, Colonial pipeline hack, May six. Take a look at the timeline. Between May six to May twelve was the time between when they. Uh, and actually, what this means is that they were actually working on the uh, on the release, but they were just waiting for the opportune time to actually release it out. Uh, and this was huge, so the timing was perfect. They launched it, got uh, got the support. Um, the first Omnibore talk, well, at the time it was called Gitbom, but now the first Omnibore talk occurred uh, May 28th. Uh, we actually were doing a lot of work before this as well uh, to, to lead up to it, but um, we ended up talking about like uh, amongst each other and, and having like various private conversations between people. Uh, we launched it, you know, we actually did the, the community launch in February of last year. So it's slightly under a year old. When we announced it, this, is the, uh, this was the, on the day of, uh, of the, uh, the reach that we had. So we had some pretty good outreach. We're, we're pretty happy with that. And interest has definitely kept, uh, has definitely kept up. Um, so, however, one of the things that we did, and uh, especially uh, Ava Black was absolutely fantastic with this, for six months went around and spoke with various people, so she would listen to, to what people had to say about, uh, about the space, uh, usually over a cup of tea or coffee or something similar, hence the, uh, hence the, the Baby Yoda, um, and found that there, was, there were uh, issues around how S-bombs were, were, were done, how do we actually correlate them to the things that we're, that we're working on. And the reality is that is in the short, small scale, it looked okay. But in the large scale, when you actually start to scale it out, uh, it actually looked a little bit more like this, like trying to trace where everything was. And the, the general response to that was, uh, was uh, horror or, uh, or frustration, or a mixture of both. Um, and this is all to answer a simple question. Uh, am I safe? Is, is, what am I, is what I am doing safe? Um, but in order to answer the question whether you're safe or not, uh, you also have to look at, again, we saw the rat's nest before, you also have to look at the simplicity of the thing you're doing because you cannot answer that question if things are too complex. And if things are too complex, there's no way you're going to be able to get everyone on board. And so what we found, uh, we've, many of us on, on, the, uh, on the project have uh, significant distributed uh, systems uh, experience. And so we aim towards things that are more simple uh, to try to keep reliable, try to keep it performant, and also so you can actually reason about the security. 
Uh, I want to make a point here. There's actually great talk by, I think it was about 15 years ago maybe, uh, at Strange Loop by a guy named uh, Rich Hickey who created the closure uh, language. Um, the talk was not about closure. The talk was about uh, simple versus easy. And just because something is simple doesn't mean it's easy. Just because easy doesn't mean it's simple. And very often you can get lulled into the idea that something is, is easy and then work out later on that when something breaks, you now have this massive rat's nest that you have to, that you have to deal with. So we wanted to avoid that. Like, yes, there may be some areas where the, where the simplicity may be at odds with the ease of use of it, but we want to make sure that what we're doing is something can be reasoned about. And there's different ways as, as well when you look at the complexity of something. So on here, we have a very simple example of a line graph, and you think, okay, well, I can actually use two points, x and y, in order to identify where, where something is. Uh, if you change your perspective, uh, you actually only need one number because you could say, well, let's angle ourselves in such a way that we only need one number in order to identify where things, where things are actually at. So part of what we're looking at is, well, how do we change our perspective a little bit in the software supply chain so that we could uh, see if there's some way we can simplify the problem a little bit, uh, a little bit further? And that was part of what we were asking the question on with, with Omnibor. We actually had a little bit, something that was a little bit more complex. We worked out, well, if we make it a little bit smaller, a little bit smaller, uh, there's, you know, what, what actually gets to the heart of what, of what we want to do. So there's three simple questions that we, uh, that, we were aim that we came across. The first one is what is the identity of something? Like what it, by identity, I don't mean like this is the, uh, the URI or URL of the package or this is the, the human name we give it. Like what is the canonical identity of what, uh, of what a thing is? Dependency of, is, what is, in the, uh, what is in the artifact? Metadata is things that are not in the artifact they are not the identity of it, but are something extra that we've learned about it. So we have to have the ability to attach metadata to whatever, whatever it is that we're doing. A really good example of metadata could be something like the, uh, the license of a, of a project. Uh, could be who, who compiled it is, is, is metadata. What, what did your image scanner say about something is additional metadata. So jumping more into identify, to identity, uh, we asked what is, what is a uh, software artifact. Uh, artifact. <laughs> so an artifact in this scenario is any software object that is of interest. Uh, one thing that all software artifacts up to now have in common, and who knows, maybe in the far future this will change, but something they all have in, in common right now is that they're represented as a byte of arrays. It doesn't matter whether you're using source code or object files, jar files, Python or Python uh, C, Debian RPMs, OCI images, it, they're all, they're all a, a represented as, a byte, as an array of bytes. So we say the two artifacts are equivalent if and only if the byte array of one is equal to the byte array of the second. So with this, this gives us a sense as to what a unique I, of, of a unique artifact ID. Of course, it'd be terrible to stick the whole application in an SBOM, so we have to do something a bit smarter. <coughs> but in general, there's three properties. It's canonical. Independent parties presented with equivalent artifacts can derive the same identity that they are unique and that two non-equivalent artifacts have a separate I and distinct identity and that it is immutable, that once you have the identity of something, it's not going to shift into something else. So these are the three properties we're, we're looking for. Some identity non-solutions that we ran into was, uh, you'll often see many things, that you see, this is actually pre prevalent in many SBOM, uh, when people think of SBOMs, is like, well, the file name. The file name is the identity of the thing. Well, file data is actually metadata. It's not actually the identity of it because your file name can change. I can change foo.c to be uh, bar.c, uh, or I can actually change what's in foo.c to something else, and so now the, the identity should, should change. If I move it to a different directory, does, has, has it changed? Or what if I take that file and just stick, it, stick the entire contents into, uh, into, a data, uh, into a database somewhere where there's no file name? Like, so you, it, file names are not quite, not quite there. They're, they're good for locating things, but they're not, but it's not good for defining the identity of something. The same problem is with URLs. Um, PURL is a little bit better in, than just the URL, but it still has the same, uh, the same set of problems. You're looking at the location of where something is, which is a hugely valuable thing, but is not the identity of, 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 an, uh, of an artifact. Um, the minimum elements of an SBOM, uh, which uh, I am actually a fan of. I know a lot of people uh, rail against them, but the reason I'm a fan of them is because they're very simple. There's something that companies can do today that move the needle. Uh, but also sets them up so if they can do this and then they can do a little bit more next time and then they can do a little bit more this year and next year and so on. So it actually gets them a, a baseline. We can increase that baseline over time. But that being said, 
it's not an identity. It doesn't actually provide you. And especially when you look at the kernel versions, like I have kernel version one, uh, 5.17.3. Uh, uh, I compile it, you compile the same version. We're actually gonna come up with two different pieces of software because uh, in general, there's maybe around 3,000 line or 3,000 files that actually get used, and depending on how I configure it and how you configure it, you're, you're going to get two different outcomes. Uh, and that's assuming that the uh, builds are also deterministic as well. Uh, so we'll ignore the term, like you could ignore determinism, uh, rather pretend it's all deterministic and you still have the same problem, which makes which makes us all sad. So uh, it turns out that we already have a, an interesting solution for identity. So if you look at Git, uh, Git actually computes an object ID to be the, uh, the identity. And what it, you have this algorithm called a Gitoid. Um, and so in terms of a Gitoid, it takes the contents of that and it generates a 20-byte hash, or uh, I should say 160-bit hash, which is the uh, uh, size of a SHA-1. There is work to turn it into SHA-2. Uh, I know that violates the immutable immutability project, uh, property we are talking about before. We actually have a solution for that that we've included in the spec, but, I, that's, but we'll, we'll get into that later. Uh, in short, the, it has a solution towards that, which is basically that you have a Gitoid, that Gitoid ends up in a file system, which happens to be the Git uh, object repository itself, and everything inside of that is identified by their Gitoid. And so what we did with Omniboard to really dive into this is we set up the identity where you, and you have you have an artifact, and that artifact is you have an Omniboard document, and that the Omniboard document itself, you say like a specific file is identified by its Gitoid, went into the creation of a particular of a particular object. So, so you have an identity of that object and the and the identity of the things that went into that object. So that's the example of the lowest one right here. You have a Gitoid of each of each file. Those all get wrapped up into whatever uh, whatever those things came together to produce ends up with its own Gitoid that is unique to to itself, and uh, and that's then represented as part of uh, as part of the dependency graph. Uh, the same thing happens when you go further up, where you have uh, uh, you have an Omnibore document that is consumed by another Omnibore document. As you get more hierarchy, you say that the particular uh, blob of a particular item is represented by a Omnibor Gitoid of that particular thing. So what this does is it gives us a graph. Like you can think of it like a, uh, I, I often call the, uh, the BOR a, a, a bag of receipts, of cryptographic receipts. Because uh, at that point, it's, it, it, what you're doing is you have a set of identity, uh, you have a, a tree of identities or a DAG of identity uh, of things that you, that you use in order to build that particular system. So uh, Git is a, uh, is a Merkle tree masquerading as a VCS, as a, ver as, a versioning, uh, uh, as a version control system. So does everyone know what a Merkle tree is? Is there any people who don't know what a Merkle tree is? <coughs> okay, so a Merkle tree is a, is a special kind of tree that is defined as uh, if you have a hash of all of the, of all of the, uh, of, of all the subtrees, so you have a tree that has several subtrees underneath of it, and you take the hash of those subtrees, and those, uh, those subtrees uh, themselves have leaf elements, and those leaf elements also have their own set of hash. So you're looking at hashes all, uh, in such a way that, you, that if you change a file, it only changes that file, all of the parents of that particular file going up to the, to the root. So that way you don't change most, most, of, the, most of the DAG. You only see in the, in the representation the changes of the, uh, of the leaf element that, that was changed and the parents moving, moving up, to, uh, up to the root. So like minimum amount of changes you can make. Uh, generally from a growth perspective, the, the, growth, the growth of changes over time, each change might uh, change maybe a log, it's a logarithmic based upon the quantity of data you have in it. So it's very efficient. It's the reason why I used to get up in the, in the morning, I'd go to work, uh, I would hit SVN update, I'd go have breakfast, come back, watch it finish. Uh, it was all ruined by Git because I'd hit Git, uh, I, would, I would do my Git pull and then like five seconds later, I can't take my breakfast that fast. So uh, Merkle trees are the, uh, is the magic behind it. And so, uh, so Git uses that, it uses the, uh, the Gitoid as the, uh, as the identifier. So you, uh, now that we have this like, dependency graph, we, we want to ask the question, what is in the artifact? <coughs> so in this scenario, uh, we have the identity of a C file, uh, uh, maybe some headers, and those go through a compiler, it re releases out, it generates an object. 
So we want to capture that information. And then, and the same with the other side. So we now have two object files. And then those get linked together to create an executable. Uh, it's actually more complex than that because you also have shared objects uh, that may already be present on the system. So when you, run an, when you run an application, it's not just the executable image. It's also all of the additional dependencies that were in the environment that get pulled into it through your, through your, uh, through your operating system, which also have their own set of things. So each of these could be represented by, uh, by a Omnibore. And that Omnibore at the top, uh, you, could, you could then generate something. So it's not just for things that are static at, at rest, but also you could use it to represent things that when you run, uh, give you something that, that gives you a bit more information. Um, also works in other environments, like in Java. Uh, everything is, is linked in dynamically. There is no, there's no concept of statically compiling things once you, once you cross class divides, uh, the, the class files. So uh, the same pattern works for, for things like Java or, or, other, or other systems. So we take this, and what we did is we generalized it. And we said we have this executable. goes back to what you saw before with Omnibore. So we generalized that particular, uh, that particular path. So in short, uh, we're able to use those gitoids as artifact IDs to represent the whole set of dependencies that, uh, that come along with it. Um, and so when we mention, so going back to this, like you, uh, just to repeat, uh, you have your artifact, like this particular artifact has two entries. So you see a blob, you have the gitoid that's attached to it. And then you have an artifact with, artifact three has its own omnibore that's attached to it as well in lexical order, so that way you get a canonicalized uh, view of, of it. So you're not, you're not guessing as to like what order did I see things. You, everything is, is explicitly ordered by, by lexical. <laughs> so this brings to the question of metadata. Uh, what is known about it? So there was a great comment that was put together by, by Jeff, who's another uh, Omnibore uh, community member and, uh, he, and contributor. He said an, an SBOM is a format for organizing metadata that describes the makeup of software artifacts. So in other words, Omnibore is specifically about the identity of things. It's not, a, it's not about how do you store the, uh, the metadata, but we still have this metadata we have to, we have to look at. So we have dependencies. All the stuff in orange is stuff that is within Omnibore. And you have all of the purple stuff on the side that is, uh, that is metadata. So what, what we are looking at as a pattern is that the metadata can use the gitoids in the orange boxes to decorate the tree. So you might, you'll have an, a, a separate database where one of them might be, I ran an image scanner. Another one might be, I ran something that checks licenses. A third one might be something like, who compiled it and gave it to me? Uh, so you have this metadata that's, that sits to the side. And that metadata is actually can be dynamic, because I run an image scanner today. I run it again six months from now. It's probably going to change, uh, unless it's a very simple program that, uh, that's, yeah, it'll, it'll change. So, so in short, we, we want to make sure we can keep this separate, but use the, use the Omnibore uh, graph as the identifier in order to, in order to, work, to work out like what, uh, what, what does the metadata uh, apply to. So uh, getting back to the example from Jeff, Omnibore is stuff on the left. The stuff on the SBOM is, is on the right. And we actually have been working with various SBOM uh, vendors. So for example, in uh, I believe it was SPDX 2.3, they've added support for, for gitoids, which then gives the ability to reference the, uh, the Omnibore uh, graph. And that was our direct uh, collaboration that we have with them. So in that scenario, it's, it's also, we're looking at what, at what is known from a, from a metadata, but it's not enough to know what is known. It's also important to know uh, how, how, it is, how it is known. And more specifically, once, if you can understand how it's known, you, the question then is, can you trust that information that's on there? Um, so this, part, this particular section was written by, uh, by Ava, and Ava is a, a major uh, voice in terms of, in terms of trust. And uh, I'll try to paraphrase the best because this, this was her part of the slides. And I'll, to paraphrase, um, when you look at something that's trust, um, trust is, you have to look at what is it that you're trusting. Are you trusting uh, the source code that's going into it uh, or what something says? Are you trusting... Are you trusting it because I gave it to you? Are you trusting it because my signature is is on it? Uh, like, wh what is it really where we root that uh, that trust in? And 
uh, signatures are a great example because something could be signed. Like, how do you know what, like, what was behind that, what was signed, what what was in it? Like, signatures give you an important piece of information, but they're also very limited in terms of the total quantity of information they can give you, which then brings us back to our sad pyramid. Uh, by the way, the, the first time this uh, image was used, uh, the contrast was way off in a previous presentation, and it was like film noir version of Kermit. It was fantastic. <coughs> so when you ask a question of like, what is trust, because this can bring us towards actually helping answer that question, um, there was a person, Dorothy Denning, who wrote about the Orange Book uh, back, in, uh, back in the early 90s, where the Orange Book said, you can build a system that you can categorically trust uh, as, as like you can trust it because it's a property of how it was built. Um, and Dorothy came forward and said, trust is not a property, but rather is an assessment based on experience, a declaration made by an observer, not a property of what, a, of, 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 uh, of what is being observed. And this is super important because just because I give you something I, and I say, oh, I used all these secure development practices in order to, so you can trust it, you can't trust it simply because I followed a set of patterns. Instead, what you have to do is observe what's, what's around it. So part of the idea is like, how do we give you that metadata? How do we make sure we can link everything together and pull that information from the, from the places that have the ability to actually pull, to give you the, the best information? And trust is also, uh, Mike Roussel wrote a book on uh, trusting in computer system of which uh, Ava was a uh, editor on. Trust is time dependent, as in I trust my, my image scanner today, but am I gonna trust the output a year from now? Absolutely not. It's asymmetrical, and asymmetrical, the best way I can describe this is the relationship you have with your bank is not the same relationship your bank has with you. <laughs> and so, it's also contextual. Like, you go into your bank, you're gonna have a different set of services that you trust them for than compared to like maybe you go into a doctor for surgery or something similar. Um, so. Uh, so it's contextual in, in that response. The same goes with computer systems. It's like it's time dependent, asymm asymmetrical, and, and contextual. Um, and so people often put their their trust into the into the build tools. And so, but what we're looking at is, if you look at what a build tool actually does, a build a build tool will tran transforms your inputs to some to some output. Uh, the problem is that you can scan the inputs, and so this is where you scan the source code, you say, okay, well, that doesn't necessarily explain the output. It helps give you a direction of what the output can be. It definitely constrains it, but you don't know exactly exactly what it is. Uh, how, about, uh, how about scanning the output? So how many of you people here can say what kind of a pie this is? Is this an, is this an apple pie, or is this, a, uh, is this pears? I mean, for, for me, if, if, it's a, if, if it has coconut in it, I'm probably gonna have a bad flavor that I'm not gonna like. Uh, I got a I got a friend who, uh, if it's an apple pie, it'll it'll he'll need an EpiPen. So knowing what's inside of it is super important. And the same goes with software. You have to know what's inside of it. And a scanner gives you some information, but it's not going to be absolutely perfect. Uh, so, so what you want to try to do is you want to try to drive that to something that's a little bit more accurate in terms of what we can trust, and we can actually trust the build tools. So we look at the build tools. The build tools will give us the information, have, have the information. They have what was going into it. By build tools, I mean the compiler itself, not Jenkins, not Maven or the makefile. I specifically mean the build tool that is actually doing the transformation. And so we can trust the, uh, we can trust the build tools to give, us, to give us more accurate information. Not to say that it's 100% perfect, but it's the, it is the best place where we can find that information and at least get some form of attestation out of it in terms of like what's, what uh, C files went or what Go files, what headers, what, was the, what were the environment variables, uh, intermediates, and so on. And so the goal of Omnibore is to be able to take that information from the build tools themselves and to be able to, to create that artifact, uh, that uh, DAG, so that we're able to then decorate that, that DAG with, with information. And we build that DAG embed an ID for, every, for everything that's there in a language heterogeneous environment, regardless of the packing formats, regardless of, and the key here is it has, is it has to get to a point where there's no developer effort. You run Go Build, you run, you run GCC, you, you run a Rust uh, or Cargo Build. Like this is stuff that should, that, that should just work. It should just give you that information. You can start decorating the, uh, the trees. Um, and to, to get to that answer is to, is to am I safe? And part of it is that when you look at what actually went into it, now that you have this information, uh, let's say deep down, like several dependencies in, you have this log for J that, that was injected into your system. Um, you have that information available because you have the metadata that was attached to it and you can say these gitoids are known to have that vulnerability based upon where, when the patch was in, based upon when the version 
uh, the version it was first found, and you read, so you can look and see whether or not those files were, were included as part, of, as part of the build. And also in the future, let's say uh, six months or a year from now, another vulnerability comes out, uh, you, the ability to tag those, uh, those particular uh, gitoids as, uh, as being unsafe uh, is, is something that would be of, of huge use to, uh, to infrastructure and, and consumers. So in short, we have, uh, we have construction of multiple, uh, of multiple systems. Actually, this is an older deck. Uh, we actually have two others that we have. So we have Go, Rust, we have work going on in LLBM, uh, Bomb SH. Uh, there's also work going on in uh, GCC as well. So, so we've been working with the compiler communities in order to get this stuff in with the, with the expectation that if you're building tools, you'll be able to use that, those annotations to, uh, to generate the, the data. Um, I'll make sure when this gets published, I'll publish the new version of it. It has, it has the additional two links on there. Uh, and with that, uh, you're also welcome to, to join and, uh, and get involved. So first, well, I want to thank you all for your time, and I don't know how much time we have left for questions. So um, does anyone know if we have time for questions? Seven minutes. Cool. So are there any uh, questions that we, uh, that we have? Okay, that, that's a good question. So, non non compiled, uh, we can take the uh, the omnibore or the the gitoids of the files themselves, and uh, and put them to, put them together in terms of saying what uh, what a package is what what a package is, and also analyze. So we still get some of the benefits of like I have a file that has a known vulnerability that I maybe pull from another project and then uh, be able to tell that that was an or maybe a dependency when I compile in, uh, but. <coughs> Um, things like Python and, and Ruby and similar are a little bit more difficult and then you have to work them into, into that. We've not worked with those particular communities just yet because we've been focusing primarily uh, on the compiled ones. Uh, but we definitely see ways that we can tie into it. Like maybe when you, do a, when you load in a Python file or load in a Ruby file, you could check the gitoid and check against a, a, a list and see whether or not you want to accept that or not. Uh, that, is, uh, that is work that has not been done yet. So if that's an area of interest, we definitely would appreciate some, some help there. Uh, Ah, the question is whether we intend to capture the gitoids of the build tools themselves. So we're, we're having some discussion on this because if you capture the build tools, that does affect the, uh, the output and whether you want this to affect or not is sort of up in the, is, is up in the air. Um, there is integration with, that we've been looking at with a project called Intoto, which captures the, what those build tools are. And I, I have an implementation of, uh, of Intoto that I've been working with to, to capture the build tools as, uh, as gitoid so we can get that information, uh, we can get that information out. Um, ah, so the question is how do we establish the, uh, the trust of the information we, that we captured there? So, <coughs> So the first one is in terms of the in terms of the inputs and outputs. So uh, again, the, this is not designed to to solve all aspects of it. So we're trying to solve a very specific problem within it, but we need help from other tools in order to in order to capture that. So uh, I brought I mentioned the Intoto one specifically because uh, many of the Intoto systems are designed so that you can capture not only what process was ran. In other words, like I ran this transformer or preprocessor, I ran this compiler, I ran this test, and uh, this is the group that, that built it. Uh, that gets signed, gets stuck into maybe a six door or something similar. Uh, but there's also the question as to whether you could trust the, uh, the tool or not. And part of, there's a couple things towards this. So one of them is when you're building out your CI CD system itself, uh, first you do want to try to keep that under, under control so that the limited people have access to it. But simultaneously, uh, some of the Intoto tools, uh, one of the ones that I work on is a project called Witness and uh, have the ability to hook in with, uh, with analyzing what, uh, uh, to, w what files that the compiler open and what it, to capture metadata on some of that stuff as well, 
or maybe there are other system calls like I make a connection out to uh, to a network somewhere to be able to capture some of that. So there's there are things there that help with some of that observability. But at the end of the day, uh, if it's about should you run a particular piece of, of software or not, you still have to root that trust into something, and that something is is tied to do you trust the agent that uh, that built it, and do you trust the agent to uh, to try to capture that that information uh, effectively. So you still have you, you still have that issue in terms of, of build trust. Um, so it's not designed to solve all the issues up and down the, the space, but it's designed to help give you additional information so you can make better decisions. So. Um, is there any other any other questions? Fantastic. Well, thank you all for your time, and uh, I'll be around. So, if you have any questions you want to ask me in person uh, while I'm here, I'd be more than more than happy to answer.